culmination of all of our talks about the dance of aliveness, the dance of relationship, uh, the dance of abundance. Today is the dance of spirit, ever present, going before us and preparing the way as we become a lamp unto our own feet, drawing others into our light and energy field. Because what are the secrets of life Tesla talked about? That if you want to know the secret to life, think in terms of energy, vibration, and frequency. And we get so caught up in the things outside of us, and when we, we remember that, that, all that attachment, you know, and all that feeling inside of our gut, it just disappears in the natural process of life itself because we got it. I and my Father, Mother, God are one. And what Jesus was talking about is that he tapped in to that cosmic consciousness so that there was no reaction outside of him. And you know that he did react. And there were times when he threw people out of the temple and threw you know, things off the tables and said, you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. So, you know, he did react. You know, people have him, he wasn't this milk toasty kind of person that a lot of people have him still hanging on the cross. He got off the cross and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. No man comes to the Father, Mother, God, except by right. And he said, of what? He said, me, Christ consciousness. He didn't mean his personality. He meant the energy of Christ consciousness. So that transcendent place that Buddha talked about, about looking outside of us with no attachment. That the spirit of non-attachment isn't that, well, oh, I don't care. It's, I love you, I'm compassionate to your situation, and I'm not gonna carry it around with me because it doesn't serve me or you. So when we look at the dance of spirit, and that energy that's flowing through each of us at such an intimate level. And we feel that, and we know that, and we connect. Because we're not always going to connect at the same vibrational frequency. It's not good or bad. I am not in this world to live up to your expectations. You are not in this world to live up to my expectations. I am I, and you are you, and if by chance we find each other, it's beautiful. And if not, it can't be helped because it's all about energy. And so we vibrate to those energies that love and support us. And someone said, well, what about all the others? I said, we bless them. It's not that we're not blessing them or judging them. And we do have a tendency to do that at times. And you know, there are a lot of standard brand religions that really condemn new thought. And I can remember being uh, in San Diego for 25 years at my ministry and I went into a restaurant. I love this little couple that had this wonderful little kind of homemade restaurant. And he said, oh, Dr. Sharon, there's, we got some ministers here. And there was just, you know, a whole table of fundamentalist ministers. And he was introducing me and uh, the name of our ministry was the Center for the Celebration of Life. And, uh, and he shared, she's the minister of the Center for the Celebration of Life. And one of them, who is very famous and I will not uh, say his name, he looked up and said, oh, New Age. <laughs> and I said, no, New Thought. He says, New Thought, what is that? I said, the laws of science, the opinions of philosophy, the revelations of religion apply to the human need and aspirations of man and woman. Nice meeting you. Excuse me. <laughs> found my place, right? So it's interesting. Uh, we bless them as well and understanding. And that when we have a need to judge, it's because we're insecure within ourselves. We're looking outside of ourselves. But spiritual reality is universal, moving beyond color, race, creed, and sexual orientation, because we are one. And I love to find spirituality in the strangest places. And one of the films and one of the books that I take out once a year is Frances Mays, her book, Under the Tuscan Sun. I take the film out, I take the book out, and it's about her life. And of course, the film you know, has a little bit of poetic license. But energetically, she is this wonderful writer. And she becomes a book critic. And her life evolves and unfolds. And it turns out that her husband ha divorces her. And she has the option to you know, pay alimony or to, you know, her own house that her mother left her the money to buy to split it with him because as her attorney said, in California it's community property. 
So she went through this whole like grieving process. And then her two friends uh, have this wonderful little party at the San Francisco Bistro. And they bring out a cake and the cake says freedom. And it was like she looked at that cake and it was just this wonderful chocolatey cake. And they, you know, they were having cake and blessing freedom. And her friend says, that she turns to her, her partner, and she said, we're going to have a child. And I cannot fly my first trimester. And so we've upgraded our tickets. And we're giving them to you to fly to Italy, to Tuscany. And first she says, no. And, and her dear friend, and I love it, Sandra Oh does such a good job on that. She just looks at her and says, I cannot believe you're turning down Italy. You're still over at divorce camp, you know, where she moved in. And when she moved in, the landlord said, now what do you do? He, she said, he said, are you going through a divorce? And she says, does it show? He goes, yeah, it does. And he said, well, she goes, I'm a writer. And he goes, well, we've got an attorney next, uh, right next to you. And he cries a lot. So we just bang on the, door, on the wall and tell it to stop. And, he's got, and so we have an attorney who gives a lot of legal advice. We've got the doctor that lives above you that passes out sleeping pills. And you're the writer that can write the suicide notes. <laughs> she goes, oh, you're one of those funny landlords. Oh, I see. Yeah, one of those funny ones. So she's at divorce camp, uh, camping out at this, you know, and it's, it's like the short range apartments so from three to six months. But he says, but a lot of people are here for years and years. And so her friend just looks right at her and says, that is not who you are, and that is not a life. And so she says, well, let me think about it. And so when she hears the attorney boo-hooing and crying and carrying on next door, and she pounds on the wall and he goes, I'm, sto I'm so sto sorry, so sorry. Can you come over? And she said, no. <laughs> and then she said, well, maybe later. And she goes, what am I saying? Maybe later. Oh, my God, i got to get out of here. So she calls her friend. She goes to Tuscany. And she said, no one will hit on you. It's, a, it's wonderful because, you know, it, it's this wonderful gay in a way. It's, it's for gays and uh, wonderful, my wonderful community. So everyone will be there to support you. You won't have to deal with any of the outer things that you're concerned about. So she goes on this amazing trip to Italy. She ends up buying a house in Tuscany. She hires these wonderful Polish men in Tuscany, Italy, uh, to fix it up. And she says to her realtor one day when a snake comes in and she's crying, and she said, what am I doing buying this house? I'm all by myself. I have three bedrooms, this huge house. He said, well, what is it that you want? She goes, I want a family. I want a wedding. I want these things. And he just looked at her and said, you know, you're always so sad. And if you keep being so sad, I will have to make love to you. And I've never been unfaithful to my wife. <laughs> so she thanked him and gave him a hug. And he left. And her friend, who, the Sandra O oh friend, uh, who is now very pregnant, flies over because her wife, her partner, decides, I don't really want to be a mother and she gets out of the relationship. So she, she's out to here, she's in Tuscany, she moves in, and it was, then she's got her Polish workers, and the Polish young one falls in love with one of the girls in the village, and they run to her for advice. And so as it all turns out, in this amazing unfoldment, is that the young couple get married because the young Polish boy who has no one in his family but her, and she said, I am his family. She tells the, the, the father of the bride, because he said, he has no family, he's nobody. She goes, I'm his family. And so they marry, they have the wedding reception in her beautiful transformed home in Tuscany. Her dear friend has the baby girl, names her Alexandra. And it was so interesting because she was the one that said, you bought a house in Tuscany, did you sign anything? She goes, yeah. She goes, how are you going to fix it up? She goes, I can fix things. And besides that, I have the, the descendants of the Olympians that can help me here in Italy. And that place is absolutely gorgeous. And so her dear friend, the realtor, said, you got everything you wanted. And she said, I did? 
And he said, yes, you did. He said, you have a wedding? You have a family? And at that moment, a young man comes in and said, I'm looking for the American writer Francis Mays. I'm from the US. And they click in that moment. She had one relationship in Italy that didn't. And he told her, don't be sad. It just, we tried to work it out. It just didn't work out. We're three hours away from each other. We tried to come together. It didn't work out. Don't be sad. Because I wish you the very, very best. And there was her life. And I thought, in our way of life, we believe in the law of correspondence. And Dr. Ernest Holmes wrote The Science of My Textbook in 1926. And in that is a chapter on the law of attraction. So that what we are putting out there may not fit our pictures, but it's what we have claimed, and it's the energy of life that allows it all to unfold for us. As within, so without. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. And when we walk through that door, sometimes that takes such courage to walk through that door. And we don't exactly know what's going to lie behind that door, but that courage of walking through the whole universe assists us in that. And we can't take our stuff with us. We want to take that baggage with us and all those grudges and stuff that happen. We can't do that. I tear down the walls of opinion that separate my brothers and sisters from me. I set them free from the projection of myself. I will not judge them with the yardstick of yesterday, for perhaps in the night an angel of light revealed to them what they are, and today they may be that. Right now, they may be that, so we cannot judge. And I walked into uh, my hairdressers yesterday and just really love them. And, and, uh, you know, he uh, introduced me to someone, and he says, oh, I'm so-and-so's so partner, who is one of the biggest sabotagers in our ministry. And I said, oh, okay. Well, interesting, you know. Remember, the ancient Chinese never cursed anyone. They only wished them an interesting life, right? <laughs> so I said, oh, interesting. And uh, I said, well, you know, give my regards. And I went off with, you know, my hairdresser, and, uh, my hairdresser said, um, do you know his partner? And I said, yes, but I said, the angel of light could have revealed to him what he is, and today he may be that. And he says, I'm going to go with that. <laughs> we'll go with that. So, you know, energetically, there's always stuff that we get to deal with. And there are, there are those energies that just, we get it. We feel it. We know it. We know our spiritual family. And there are those others that we just draw the larger circle and include them. And they don't have to be the intimate bosom buddy. It's just energetically, we really are all one. And whatever aspect someone needs, we need to send them that rather than judge them. And you know, that's a high order. That's a really high order. And sometimes, you know, we just don't feel that evolved, do we? <laughs> we just don't feel that evolved on that particular day. And that's OK, too, because we include ourselves in the equation of self-love and compassion. And one of the things um, that I just loved when I was in Scotland, and I took the little double-decker bus tour, it's called the Hop On Hop Off uh, bus, and we went to the old town of uh, Edinburgh, and they had a great big dog, a sculpture, and um, they said, oh, that's, uh, that's that wonderful, uh, wonderful terrier. It's a Sky Terrier, and they have this statue because uh, great, it's, he's called Gray Friar Bobby, and there's a, all kinds of things named after this dog. That when his owner, who was the night watchman for the Edinburgh police, uh, he came down with pneumonia and he passed away. And they buried him in the Kirk uh, Cemetery. And the dog sat at the grave and would not move. People tried to move him. He would not move. So they brought him food. And then someone said, well, he's not licensed. So the pro provost of uh, uh, Edinburgh bought his license. And that dog sat there for 14 years at his master's grave. 14 years. So they've erected a statue. And when the dog passed away, John Gray was his master. Like in the next plot, 
is Grey Friar Bobby, the dog that sat by his master's grave for 14 years. And we talk, talk about the dance of spirit and the energy, that we are so intimately connected at such a deep level, and that one moment we may be crying because a snake crawls through the window and thinking, what did I do this for? How could I have done this? And there's someone loving that, that reflects back to us exactly who we are. So it all shows up, not necessarily in the way we thought it would show up, but it all unfolds miraculously because we are aligned with spirit. And when we get it, that it's a spirit, mind, and body relationship, then something opens. When we were in Africa, part of the, uh, the presentations were these wonderful cultural dances that would come in, and they would wear their native garb. And then, then uh, Father Ida would give us Naira, which is this Nigerian money. And we would, uh, Clayton remembers this very clearly, we would take the Naira, and we would, we would dance also. We, they'd get everybody, and, and the stage, and the, and the wonderful students that are emulating their cultural dances and the rituals and the energy and everybody's dancing and the drummers are drumming and, and the musicians are playing their flutes and guitars and everybody is dancing and throwing money and it's just this amazing celebration of life. And I absolutely love that. And in their mass at the Madonna University, the same thing, the cultural dancing and the energy of their culture. So here, I am not a Catholic. I am a graduated Catholic. I know some of you are recovering Catholics, but I am a graduated Catholic. And I remember I was sharing uh, the other day that the Mother Superior, and I used to go to these wonderful Catholic retreats at 17 years old and 18, and she said, you have the calling and you're avoiding it. That meant in the nunnery. And I said, well, Mother, I like boys. And she goes, oh, then yours is another vocation. She was never clear on that, but I figured she meant marriage, right? So energetically, when we can feel that oneness and that energy and realize the dance of spirit is in every living thing, that I can hear my plants when they're thirsty. I can feel the energy. I have just adopted a little Karen Terrier that originated in the Isle of Skye in Scotland. So when I came home from Scotland and RJ had this precious little terrier in his arms, it was love at first sight, right? So what they told me, the director of Loving All Animals said, most ministers would look out and see a dog in the audience and say, please take it outside. You end up adopting it. So, you know, that happens as well because there is such a connection in the universe that we are all part of it. And as we gather together today, we know that there is a power for good in the universe greater than we are. We are using it. We're open to it. And where are we going? Higher, higher yet. yet. Where? Higher, higher yet. yet. Where? Higher, higher yet. yet. And so it is. God bless you.